This is One Universe at a Time. I'm Brian Korberlein. Amino acids are one of the building blocks of life. They allow our bodies to grow and repair themselves. Our guest today is Dr. Andre Hudson, an associate professor of biology at the Rochester Institute of Technology. He will explain how amino acids could also be the key to helping our bodies fight infections from bacteria that are becoming more resistant to traditional antibiotics. My understanding of amino acids is pretty basic. Okay. So I know they're kind of a building block of proteins, and I think there's about 20 that we use in the human body. Right. And some of them we make, and some of them we don't make. Right. We have to get from foods. Right. Beyond that, what, what is the role of amino acids in terms of our biology or biology in general? Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. And um, they're, they're relatively not sophisticated molecules. They're not they're like big aromatic, big globular molecules. Right. What they are is just that they have an essential carbon, what is known as the alpha carbon. Mm-hmm. And to the alpha carbon, you have a, uh, a carboxylate um, acid group. Um, that's where it gets the acid part from. Right. And then another electron is uh, on the carbon is an amino group or amine group. That's where it gets the amino part of the molecule. Okay. There's a hydrogen, and then there's what is called an R group, and the R group is kind of interchangeable, right? Right. And that's yeah. the kind of the spice of the molecule because you could just interchange the R group, and it gives that particular amino acid a different flavor. Right. So, so it's, kind, it's kind of like Legos in the sense exactly. that there's, there's a basic part that's always the same, same. Exactly. and then there's this extra part that defines what type of amino acid exactly, it is. Exactly, right. Okay. They kind of divide it up into two groups. As you stated, one group is called what we call proteogenic or proteinogenic. Okay. And that means that those are the amino acids that are incorporated into proteins. And there are um, other amino acids that are called non-proteogenic amino acids. They have varying roles. Uh, for example, in peptidoglycan or murine mm-hmm. in bacteria, um, we have amino acids that are not incorporated into proteins. Right. Now, because they're um, what we call chiral molecules, right, you could, right. if you think about a carbon in three dimension, you could kind of turn it around, you can right. rotate it, so forth. Some might twist, twist. kind of left-handed right. ones, some might exactly. twist right-handed. Right. 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 So you have what is called the L amino acids or the D right. amino acids. Okay. And so nature kind of decides, and for proteins, it says, I'm going to use only the L ones. Right. There's no D ones. So you could have L lysine and D lysine, okay. L methionine and D methionine. But the enzymes that pick or choose these amino acids to put them into protein when it's building proteins only choose one version of them which will make sense because if you want a kind of like an efficient process you don't want to waste time having to kind of sift through the varying ones to say okay i want the l ones and the d ones here and the l ones there and the d ones here right so So it's kind of like a hand and glove you you need the right-handed glove if you're going to have your right right hand exactly you can kind of make it fit but right. it's not going to work well. Right, exactly. Right. So in a nutshell, those are um, amino acids. And it turns out that photosynthetic organisms and, uh, or photosynthetic uh, cohorts, as I like to call them, and some bacteria or most bacteria can make the subset all 20 of them. Animals, mammals, and uh, we can only make 11 out of the 20 that we need. So the other nine we have to get either directly or indirectly from a primary source, normally, which is plants, right? Um, through our diet. So plants can make all 20. Plants can make and all 20. And then we can only make 11, 11, so that's why we have to eat plants exactly, in some sense. Right. It's kind of like vitamin C. Exactly. We have to have that. We right. can't make it our own. Right. Or we eat chicken because the chicken eat corn, and that's how the chicken gets those nine amino acids, okay. right? Okay. So there's this kind of a pyramid um, going up um, that's linked directly through our diet. I'll surmise, I'm not an um, evolutionary biologist, but I'll surmise that at some point in time in early development or early um, in our early history of animal or mammal history, we were able to um, synthesize all 20. But I guess we lost those um, capabilities or... Something that you know, didn't matter at the time or gave right, us an advantage, right. and so then we went off that uh, direction. Yes. One of your interests is in how this relates to antibiotic resistance. Right. When we think of antibiotic resistance, it's, it's the downside of evolution. We use antibiotics to kill off bacteria, right. and then some of them survive, and right. they can be more robust against antibiotics. Right. Well, it's not so much directly related to antibiotic resistance, but it's uh, it's a plausible and feasible way, I think, to combat antibiotic resistance, oh, or okay. to kind of develop more medicines or more co- compounds, or either develop them or discover them towards. Right. And it, it's a basic premise that if you have a particular pathway that is present in bacteria, or most likely gonna be present in bacteria, 
and not present in humans, then why not target those enzymes in those pathways to inhibit them or right. to stop the bacteria from growing, right? Right. So there's a Because that's the real challenge, right? challenge. It's a, I can kill off the bacteria, but I may also kill off the right. patient. Right. Exactly. And, right. and that's, it's the challenge of doing one but not the other. Right. It's not a novel idea, really. I mean, for example, what we call the beta-lactam-based antibiotics, penicillin, mm-hmm. bacitracin, and so forth. These are compounds that inhibit enzymes in peptidoglycan or bacterial cell wall by synthesis. Okay. And the reason why they were so effective, or they are still effective, is that humans don't make cell wall. We don't make um, peptidoglycan. Right. And so if you target an enzyme in peptidoglycan by synthesis, it's going to kill bacteria and not kill ourselves. It goes off the same premise. Why not target, you know, for example, the lysine biosynthesis pathway? Since humans don't make lysine, why not those? Right? So you're basically eliminating the, the factory that can produce this particular right. amino acid. Right. And since we don't make it, it doesn't bother exactly. us. It's a, specific, it's a specificity issue. It's like, you know, let's make the compound specific for a type of life, bacteria, and not right. inhibit mammalian or eukaryotic so right. Was, um, the other part of the, the argument is how to make these compounds specific. You could even kind of subdivide it down where you could have an organism that make lysine or three different organisms, and they all make the same compound in different ways. Right? So you could now then say, let me target. You could even kind of sub it down or concentrate it down to make it specific on the species or the genus or species level, for example. Okay. So instead of killing all bacteria, right, then you could right. say, hey, I'm going to target this enzyme because this particular bacteria make lysine right. via pathway X. And or, that's another challenge and that's because another challenge. You, if you kill off all bacteria, right. you've also killed off things like gut bacteria that exactly. we need to digest food. Right. Or make vitamins. Or make uh, vitamins, or, right, yeah. Or minerals that we need that, right. that we cannot make, right? So I think uh, since uh, antibiotic resistance is a huge, you know, it's a pandemic issue, it's not a local issue, or it's like a, mm-hmm. it's a, you know, it's a worldwide issue now. Everything right. should be in play. And this is one of the, um, the mechanisms that we should use. It's really kind of a race against the clock. I mean, race, in the sense exactly. that we're so used to being able to use all these antibiotics. Right. That, that we've kind of grown complacent. Right. One of the issues that I see is what I termed or deemed pacification medicine. Right? Penicillin was so effective. If you look at the history of the, read the literature, you know, even before the, the drug was put out to the masses, there was reports of being resistant, so bacteria being resistant to penicillin even before mm-hmm. it was you know, mass produced and mass used. Antibiotic resistance it's a, is an evolutionary problem. It, it's just like in football. I like to tell students, just like in football, right? So my favorite team is the Bills, right? And I don't, I don't like the Steelers, right? So right. If, the steel, if the Bills are going to run the same offensive play down after down after down after down, right? Then the Steelers are going to know what's coming, and they could figure out a way how to stop the play. Right. right. Well, Long term, they could change what players they exactly. use. Exactly. Bacteria do the same thing, right? So you challenge the bacteria with the same drug each and every time. Right. What you're doing is you you kind of priming it to say, hey, next time, then let's start shifting around the enzymes to start degrading or let's start right. co-opting another enzyme from another species that could degrade it. Over time, you get this this tug of war effect where you know you're forcing the drug towards the bacteria, and the bacteria is kind of developing at the same time. And at some time, right. something is going to overlap where it's going to figure it out. And right. if it figures it out, then it's going to keep it. That's a good thing, right? So then right. It, it just kind of keep that um, That's what survives that and reproduces, and then exactly. that's spread it through right. the entire system. Right. You know, but uh, going back to the pacification medicine, that these drugs work so well and were so good for such a long period of time that, you know, you would go to the doctor and you had a sprained ankle and it's, oh, penicillin, right? <laughs> I have a headache, oh, penicillin, right? It makes me feel better. It, makes it doesn't better, do any harm, right? so go right. ahead and do it. Right. So there's a lot of cases where, you know, the, the patient will go in and tell the doctor, you know, you know, last time I came and I had a sprained ankle, you gave me drug X and it made me feel better, and so give it to me right. again. Where the kind of the patient was actually the one determining what drug or what medication they would use right. to get. Right. And a funny story, I had uh, my son had an ear infection, a viral ear infection, and I went to the pediatrician and the pediatrician wanted to give him amoxicillin. And I said, well, but it's not a bacterial infection. Like, why would, you know, it wasn't an ear infection, it was a cold. Uh, right. cold um, so, symptoms in one day. I said, but it's not a bacterial infection. Why? And she kind of looked at me puzzled, like, huh? Like, no one has ever asked me that before, right? <laughs> and I could, so, because I'm I, I'm cognizant of the science behind it, 
I kind of challenged her a little bit, and I, I could see where the lay public or someone who's not understanding the science behind the drug, so to speak, right. or the motive mechanisms of the drug, would just, just take the doctor's word for it and just say, hey, you know, I, she know, or he or she knows what she's talking about, so right. amoxicillin should work. My kid's sick. Make my kid feel better. Right. By and, any means necessary. Right? Yeah, by any means necessary. And, and if the doctor says, well, you know, it's it's a cold. Right. Go home for three days, they'll feel better. Right. It doesn't seem very satisfactory. Right. You know, my kid's hurting now. I want I want to fix. Right. And if you say, well, take this. Right. It's not going to hurt you. Right. Go ahead and take it. And, okay, the doctor has done something right. for me. I feel better now. Right. You know, I just came back from the American Society for Microbiology. And there was this huge um, plenary session on just antibiotic resistance and the challenges you know, that we have and ultimately we're going to face. And one of the issues that they talk about was this link between antibiotic resistance and agricultural industry. You know, many decades ago, they found that if you feed animals, farm animals, antibiotics, they get yeah. fatter and more meats, more yes. muscle. You can pack them more closely Almost together. Closer, you don't right. get you know infections to your right. entire right. flock or right. whatever. So not even used for infection control or disease control, as a matter of fact. It was just you feed them more antibiotics, they make more fat cells, and they get, they get bigger in, mm-hmm. in terms of masses. And so, you know, farmers sell their chickens by the pound or their right. beef by the pound, right? right? So they were, they're feeding um, antibiotics to animals as not a uh, way to combat disease most of the time, but it's just a way to put on biomass right. To, right. To, to make And if you don't do it, your competitor is going to and exactly. you're going to be out right. of the market. Right. And so a lot of the, um, the problems we see now is not on the human side, but it's on the kind of the farm animal side where farmers for decades have just been doing this as a common practice right. just to you know to get biomass to, to reap as much, much right. more profit. And that allows the, the antibiotic bacteria to exactly. survive in chickens or pigs or something. Exactly. And then when it comes to people, right. they're already primed against right. that. These bacteria are out in the environment in the farm, right? Mm-hmm. If you're pumping in the antibiotic to these farm animals, right? It's going to go through their body, and they're going to excrete it, and those ex- materials are going to be in the soil, and mm-hmm. you know it's going to, you know, it, it's kind of like a, a, a snowball effect. You know, you right. start out small, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger over time. Individually, it's not that big of a deal. Right. If we do it just once, it's right. not that big of a deal. Right. It's the long-term, yeah, exactly. gradual change right. that then all of a sudden it's coming back in right. force. Right. And, you right. know, they've been building an army for right. 10 exactly. years. Right. So, I mean, it's a big issue. And um, I heard uh, one of the speakers at the conference was Joe Hendelsman, who actually works. Uh, it's a kind of a scientific liaison for President Obama. And she mm-hmm. stated that um, they're going to double the funding from $600 million to $1.2 billion um, to, to look at issues related to microbiology, of which antibiotic research is a big chunk, it, it's a big chunk of, right. the, of that, um, because um, you know, it's, you know, they, she listed a couple of things. One was climate change, and the other one was uh, antibiotic resistance as the, right. the kind of the, the next big thing coming out of the pike. And it's fascinating that, that what, what you're doing is you're taking an approach to attract you know, antibiotic resistance by kind of going at the building blocks. Right. Uh, eliminate their ability to build, right. and that'll take them down. Exactly, yes. You're listening to One Universe at a Time. I'm your host, Brian Corperline. We've been talking with Dr. Andre Hudson, Associate Professor of Biology at RIT, about the link between amino acids and antibiotic resistance. In the second half of our show, Dr. Hudson gets to ask the questions, and I will answer. He's curious about whether amino acids form naturally in space and what this means in the search for extraterrestrial life. So I'm interested in to find out the link between amino acids on Earth and in space. Yeah, so okay. Since I'm naive and I'm not an astronomer, if I was to go to space and I was looking for, for example, lysine, is there a possibility that I would find lysine or will I find kind of the building blocks of lysine and how much of that compound will be actually in space? The short answer is yes, you would find amino acids in space. And and we know this because we found meteorites that contain amino acids. And when you talked about the handedness, for example, we find them with both left-handed and right-handed forms. Oh, interesting. And so we know they're not necessarily biological in origin. So when we find them, we find kind of an even mix of left and right, which would bring forth the idea that they're actually formed abiotically. 
but they're fairly common. It's it's kind of an interesting thing because if you look at you know the human body and amino acids, the primary elements would be hydrogen and then carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And the fascinating thing about that is that hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. Uh -huh. So from the origin of the universe, hydrogen and helium were the two right. elements. There was a little bit of lithium, some other things, but but those are basically it. And so all of the heavier elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, everything down, iron, you know, silver, gold, and everything else, had to be formed by some astrophysical process. You can look at the distribution of atoms in terms of how abundant are they on Earth, or how abundant are they in space, and you find that some are more abundant than others. And hydrogen, by far, is the most abundant. Helium is the second most. We don't really use helium. It doesn't react well with things because it's a noble gas. Right. Things like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are actually really abundant, and they're more abundant than other elements. So in many ways, our bodies and, and you know, plants and animals are made out of the most abundant elements in the universe, you know, except for helium. And part of that is very based upon the fact of how stars create energy and how elements are fused within the cores of stars. So, so when you look at a star like our sun, or majority of the evidence is doing is fusing hydrogen into helium. And so it's taking, you know, hydrogen atoms, protons, and smacking them together through a process, eventually become helium. But there's a secondary process that will use to fuse hydrogen to helium in another way. So rather than just building up a chain just from hydrogen, it'll use carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And so what will happen is the protons will interact with carbon and it will produce nitrogen and some other things and then it will introduce with the nitrogen produce oxygen and some other things and then helium oh. and this cycle is called the cno cycle the carbon nitrogen oxygen cycle and it's one of the fundamental aspects for most stars for smaller stars like our sun most of the energy is actually just the hydrogen reaction what we call the pp chain but the secondary one is the cno cycle in larger stars, the type of stars that would eventually explode into supernova, the CNO cycle is actually more dominant. And so what happens is, in these large stars, you're producing a lot of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Mm -hmm. And then when they explode, that carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen gets thrown out to the universe, and so it's relatively abundant. Mm -hmm. When they're looking for life on other planets or other entities, I should say, mm -hmm. they normally look for water, which makes sense. Right. But could they kind of just like look for, now that on Earth we know what the kind of the primary building blocks are, you know, right. amino acids and we need sugars and right. lipids and such. Why don't they look for those molecules instead of looking for well, water? Well, they do. This is actually one of the things that has shifted in that the traditional view of chemistry in space is that it probably wasn't very active because it's extremely cold. You're talking about tens of Kelvin in terms of a temperature of something yeah. out in deep space. And it would also tend to be fairly diffuse. And so you wouldn't get a whole lot of chemical reactions for that. So we would have things like water and carbon monoxide and things like this. But what we found is actually there's a lot of complex chemistry going on. And there's, there's several reasons for that. One is that dust particles grains of, of different things can act as catalysts. And so you can get surface chemistry, for example. So even in the cold of space, you can get more complex molecules. Oh, it's like an enzyme, right? It's like, like an enzyme, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the other thing is that we find that, that a lot of these molecules can in fact survive longer than we thought they might. One of the things is that there's a lot of high energy particles and uh, things like ultraviolet light that would tend to break apart these large complex molecules. And what we're finding is that a lot of these can find places, either in the shadows of dust grains or within clouds, where they can survive longer. So we've actually found much more complex chemistry within these gas clouds and dust clouds and stuff. We've also found things like amino acids and like sugars in meteors. So meteors that have hit Earth will find these complex chemicals. So the building blocks of life, as we would say, seem to be fairly common. And since they're made from fairly common elements, they, they are probably very common. Yeah. So you, you think it's just a matter of time before we find life somewhere I, else? Given what we've all seen in terms of the number of planets that, that are within some type of good temperature zone, given the vast commonness of water, given the, the common aspect of you know amino acids and other things, it would seem to me that life would be fairly common. 
we know A, we know D, but B and C are still a bit fuzzy right. in terms of the steps. So we know we've got water, we know we've got the building blocks, and we know that on Earth we've got a rich complexity of life, but we haven't found that elsewhere. For something like Mars is normally seen as the place where we're going to find life. And traditionally, that's kind of what it's been. It's a, it's a planet that's not too cold. It's got the right elements. If it has enough water, maybe we'll find life. But there's, there's actually a shift now towards places that are more distant, places like Europa, that is one of the moons of Jupiter, or Ganymede, which is around uh, Jupiter, some of the Saturnian moons, Titan, for example, might actually have a better opportunity because there's plenty of liquid water there, which we don't see on Mars, and there's enough elements there that there might be a way for life to evolve. So that, oh. that shift of, you know, where might we find life is, is an interesting question. So there's a lot of people who are really eager to go, for example, to the moons of Jupiter and start scraping the surface and stuff because maybe there's life there. Are there plans to do that in the near future? There are plans. NASA just got approved for a Europa mission. They would fly over the region. One of the things we know now is that a lot of these moons will actually cast off uh, water vapor. But the idea would be that it would go, you know, to Jupiter and and then pass over these moons and try and collect some of the material there. If there's life in that water, then we would be able to collect enough to detect it. So if it was fairly plentiful, because it's casting the stuff, it's got these plumes and things that we might be able to detect. So it. these are like water jets that are just spewing out? Yeah, basically what happens is the moon has certain cracks or, or what you can call kind of geologic activity. They call them... Um, it's kind of probably a volcano on Earth, but instead of lava, yes, it's water. Yes, it's a cryovolcano, oh. cryovolcanism. So oh. it's basically some type of water or methane or something as a liquid where we would have the magma. And so you get this activity and they create, you know, water vapor plumes that come out. And so the idea is that we'd be able to detect things with that. The mission that people would really love is for something to actually land and then drill down. Europa is a moon that has an icy surface, has an icy crust, but there's liquid water underneath. How big is the crust, though? Is it? That's one of the big questions okay. that we don't know. We know there's a crust. We know there are cracks, so it may actually be fairly shallow, or it could be a kilometer thick. Okay. You know, we just we don't know yet. But if we could get down to it, if we could actually land on it and then drill down, that would be a really cool thing to actually go and, and actually look in the oceans of these moons. All right. That's kind of like the ultimate mission, but we don't have anything remotely planned for that yet. So I was watching a uh, documentary some time ago, and... They were talking about uh, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, I guess, mm-hmm. that were launched in the 70s. Yes. And apparently they're still... They're still going. going they're still going. Can folks on Earth still communicate with them, or, or are they so far out that we can't communicate with them? No, we still do. And in fact, Voyager 2 is still being used for scientific missions. Oh. It was a nuclear-powered satellite. And so the, as the nuclear material decays, it gets less and less power. So it's it's gradually running down. But yeah, Voyager 2 has gone out to the point where some people would say it's left the solar system, hasn't really left the solar system, but it's gotten past the kind of envelope of pressure from the sun. So what we would call the heliosphere. Right. The sun is producing all this energy and, and material will get thrown off from it. And there comes a point where it can't go out and it reaches the, the kind of interstellar wind. Mm. So the solar wind meets the interstellar wind and you get what's called the heliopause where it kind of breaks in the same way that you would see water from two different areas come and they come to a stop. And Voyager 2 has crossed that and we've seen that crossing period. So it's still active and it's still doing oh, research. Nice. Now, one thing I want to ask you, it's kind of not related, but it's I think it's important for me so I could tell my son and... Mm-hmm. Tell him that I heard it from an astronomer. It was a couple years ago. He, I guess the the big news that Pluto was not a planet, uh-huh. and um, people were upset about it. Like um, very so upset. Yeah. Why? Why? I kind of understand. You know, it's you know, what they call the Kuiper Belt and all mm-hmm. these little rocky like stuff that. Right. I I don't understand. Given the definition of a planet, by what you will see in a textbook, it's I don't see why Pluto was taken off the list. You know how we make, as we get more information, we can classify things more finely? Right. It's the same type of thing with Pluto. When Pluto was first discovered, we didn't know the size of it. We couldn't tell what the size of it was because if you see something very faintly, you can only tell by how bright it is. So it could be very bright, but very small, or it could be very dark, but very large. 
And so we had no idea what size it was. So we called it a planet. As we found out more about it, we found out that it was actually less like the planets that we know and more like other objects that are out there of similar size. And so there was a decision to reclassify it. So why and, couldn't it just bring in the other small objects? Of well, that may happen. Okay. The thing is, is that it's an arbitrary definition. Right. I mean, it, you can yeah, see Yeah, that was it, my point. It's, it's, it's by the definition of something that's globular or round and kind of orbit, or could use it something to do with its gravitational pull to kind of slingshot its way around the sun or something. Right, right. So, the, and, the, and the definition is that it has to be spherical in size. It has to be right. large enough to be spherical or approximately spherical. And it has to have cleared its path. Right. And Pluto hasn't. Pluto crosses the orbit of Neptune, so it actually becomes closer than Neptune and farther away from Neptune. So it's not considered a planet in that sense, and that was really kind of the definition. And we found other things that are like it that also don't clear their path, and so we've called them dwarf planets. But it's one of those things that that people find, it, it upsets them. Yeah. And, and I think, my own idea is that I think it's going to change. I think it's after we have the Pluto mission and we've got high resolution images of Pluto, I think you're gonna see a shift to, okay, Pluto will be a planet and Ceres will be a planet, which is the, the one in the asteroid belt, the largest asteroid that used to be a planet and then became named an asteroid. So I think, and then you'll have Quarar and Haumea and Makimaki and Eris, they will all be planets. Right. So it, yeah, it's an arbitrary definition, but it's, it's how we categorize it. We've been talking with Dr. Andre Hudson, an associate professor of biology at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Our program is produced at RIT by Mark Gillespie, with support from the RIT College of Science. I'm your host, Brian Korberlein. Thanks for listening to One Universe at a Time.